Hello and welcome to Your Living A Course in Miracles call. My name is Jared Krebs. I'm here in San Antonio, Texas. And today we have special guest, Gary Renard. He is back. Gary, welcome to the call. Uh, it's great to be back. It's fun to be here. Oh, we are so glad you're here. And we are excited to promote the event that we're having on Saturday, April 23rd in San Antonio. And it will also be a virtual event. So if you're watching from anywhere around the world, you can actually access this event. The link will be in the comments of this YouTube video. And uh, we will be showing the, the, all the info during this call as well. And also, if you'd like to be part of our group, it's called Living A Course in Miracles Audio Book Club. We are on Facebook. You can look us up right there in, uh, I guess, search Facebook. You'll see us. We listen to the works of Gary Renard on audiobook and also Kenneth Wapnick. And it is a ton of fun. We have these calls every Friday night and Saturday morning. And they're Zooms. They are recorded. Uh, it's just a lot of fun to be in a community with, with Course in Miracles students. And Gary, I just want to thank you for all of your contributions. Uh, if it wasn't for you, I would not understand the course. And I would probably have never opened the book. But because I heard Disappearance of the Universe on audio, it changed my whole life. And now I'm one of the most dedicated students I know. I read the book every morning. I read all the Ken Wapnick journey through the texts. And uh, I just love everything that's um, really that you've put out as well, that you're, you're all four of your books. I'm so excited to have you uh, visiting San Antonio, you and Cindy. And yeah. Um, yeah, so what would you like to open up with? Do you have a message for us before we start? Uh, yeah, I think that I'm really trying to get people to focus on you know, how big they are because everything in uh, the universe's projection, which is the ego's projection, is exactly the opposite of the truth. You know, so as people, or at least we thought we were people, uh, we've come to think of ourselves as actually being very uh, small and the universe being huge, really big. The truth is exactly the opposite. We are actually bigger than the universe of time and space. Uh, I've been emphasizing that lately because it really is uh, the truth because everything that we see in the universe is actually a projection that is coming from us. Uh, and if it's coming from us, then that must mean that in actuality, we are bigger than the universe of time and space. And nothing in a projection is ever really any bigger than you. It just looks that way, like in a movie theater. You know, it looks bigger than you on the screen, but the truth is it's in this little piece of film and it's really nothing. And unless you shine a light through it, or in this case of the projection, we're shining a hologram, uh, which has laser light going through it. So you have uh, the printout sort of, then you have the, the laser beam going through it and through a, an interesting series of events, it looks and uh, seems and feels extremely real and it's brilliant. I mean, it, it's, uh, it's actually a, an amazing job that was done by the ego, it's, even though it's not real. I think uh, Ken Wapnick once said he, he thought that the ego did a pretty impressive job as far as making it real or seeming to be real uh, is concerned. So even the human body, you know, you see all these bodies out there and they're very convincing. And, and just to make sure they got all kinds of things inside of them, you know, like organs and a heart and all this blood pumping around and all, you know, diseases and all, all this uh, intricate stuff going on. And it's all there to convince us that it's real. And in fact, we wouldn't buy into it if it wasn't that convincing. So uh, that's the ego's job. And one of the things that the ego has done by making a singular body, which is uh, what the ego does best in a thousand uh, different ways, is that it, it's made us feel and look very small. And uh, at one point, the Course describes it as this miserable self-image that we have when the truth is, is exactly the opposite and we're actually bigger than the universe of time and space. So uh, for anybody who's feeling uh, small, I just want you to know the truth is exactly uh, the opposite. And uh, by the way, when it comes to uh, San Antonio, uh, Cindy's going to be coming with me. So uh, that'll be great to have both of us there. Uh, she's actually only doing 
I think, two workshops with me this year. Uh, it's going to be uh, San Antonio and one other up in uh, Monterey, uh, California, later in the year. But aside from that, uh, she's not doing too many things live. Now, she prefers to do things online. We have our online uh, classes, and she hasn't done any of those yet this year. Uh, she hasn't been able to speak for three months, but her voice is getting better. Uh, the doctor gave her some steroids. Uh, so I was going to say, what, are you going to start looking like the Incredible Hulk or, or something if you're on steroids? And, uh, and she said, no, it's, it's just designed for the throat. And she says her voice voice is already getting stronger. So uh, that'll probably work. And uh, this happened once before to her a few years ago. And finally, her voice came back. I think it just needed a lot of rest. Uh, it happened uh, that time, maybe 10 years ago, because we were on a cruise of the Greek islands that we were hosting for uh, some of our readers. And uh, I think she got some kind of a viral infection or, or something, something strange in the Greek islands. Uh, this time, it was more straightforward. She was singing uh, karaoke right after Christmas. And she, she sang way out of her range, and she, she gets excited singing sometimes. And she really uh, kind of damaged her throat by singing too far out of her range and singing uh, too loud, you know, for too long. So, uh, you know, that's been a difficult thing for her to overcome. But she, she's doing well, considering. And we've had forgiveness lessons uh, because of that, because it seems like every five or 10 minutes, she'll come up to me and write something, write a note that I have to read. You know, and I'm trying to do things online, and I'm trying to eat, you know, things like that. And all of a sudden, there's a note in front of my face that I have to read. And, it, you know, and it really, it's really screwing me up, gang. But, uh, you know, it, it'll be over soon. And uh, I've been forgiving it, doing my job. You know, that's my real job. That's what my teachers, uh, Arden and Percy, told me. They said, you know, no matter what your job looks like, your real job is to practice forgiveness always. And so I try to remember that, which is not always easy in the uh, the face of things like the uh, international events that have been going on, like uh, the war in Ukraine is very difficult. Uh, I have a friend uh, from Ukraine and her name is Victoria and she still has family in Ukraine, her father, her grandmother, uh, and other relatives, friends, and she happened to be from Miami, so she came to the workshop last Saturday, and I let her get up for a few minutes and discuss what's going on with her, and uh, it's not easy. You know, there's some things that are a lot more difficult to forgive than other things, and of course, as, as course students, we're supposed to learn that that's not the truth, that it's all the same, because none of it's true. And I think that we know that intellectually, but a time comes every now and then when even though you know it intellectually, it's a little bit difficult to really put it into practice. So we kind of focused on that uh, last Saturday. And remember uh, tonight, no matter what we talk about, no matter what the uh, questions are, there is no order of difficulty in miracles. Not really, it just looks that way because we have been tricked big time by the ego and this enormous projection, which is nowhere near as big as we think it is, but it looks that way. And we got tricked and we bought into it. And our job now is to not be uh, taken in by appearances, you know, even deaf. You know, the, the Course says about the teachers of God, they see the dream figures uh, come and go, but they are not deceived by what they see. And uh, I'm not deceived by what I see. I, I no longer believe in death. In fact, the Course says, all right, there is no death, but there is the belief in death. So if you can remember that it's just the belief and that it has no reality to it, the only reason it seems so real and despicable is because you've invested your belief in it. Then maybe you can remember to start taking that belief back and putting it in God and his kingdom which is what the Course is asking us uh, to do. So I didn't know I was gonna say all that, but I'm glad I did. So I, uh, I think we're gonna have questions and answers yes. tonight. Yeah, I was just writing that down. There is no death, there's only the belief in death. Yeah. 
Yeah, and, and it says uh, to us in the manner for teachers, it says, uh, you know, teacher of God, accept no uh, compromise in which death plays a part. And it's not saying that people won't appear to come and go and that people won't appear to die. I think it's like, I don't know, a couple hundred thousand people in the world die every day. You know, but uh, it's all set up. It's all set up to make us believe that we are bodies and that our time is coming and for us to fear death. But the real reason that we fear death is because we fear God. And so the ego hides that behind the idea of death, which is why those are the last two obstacles to peace in the course, the fear of death and uh, the fear of God. And once you lose your fear of God, you won't fear death either because the two of them go together. And uh, only one of them is true, and that's God. Man, I'm just I'm just taking notes right now. This is great. <laughs> Thank you, Gary. Yeah, um, I I'm still I think I'm still in my workshop mode. I know, man. Yeah. Like you're, you're in the flow. You're in the flow right now. Well, um, before we open it up for questions, I just want to. Um, remind everybody here that you can hit the raise your hand button. It's on Zoom under reactions. There's a little spot to raise your hand. Now we're just gonna go and order down the, uh, the raising, hand, raising of hands. I see a couple of hands coming up. Um, I, I do wanna start with the question. Um, my question for you, Gary, is on um, looking at the body the same as I would look at this blender bottle or this, this um, desk or this computer like I was listening today from Ken Wapnick how it's all the same. Like the body is 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 an inanimate. I, I mean, it, it seems like it's animated, but it's really a projection, and it's no different than than this microphone or like it's it's the same exact thing. Meaning that it's it's kind of like all a projection. Therefore, it's all kind of like my brother. Like it's all if if I look at it a certain way, I'm seeing love everywhere because it's all just projections and. So could you comment on that way of uh, looking at it and, and seeing the body that way? Uh, yeah, you know, it's kind of like uh, Einstein described it, an optical delusion of consciousness. The ego has made it look like we're inside of the body and that we're seeing the projection with the body's eyes. And so that's another part of the illusion to make it seem you know, so real and personal. Uh, the truth is it's not personal, even sickness, it's not personal, but we take it seriously because we actually think that this is us because we've been set up uh, so well. And it was all a dream. Uh, you were never actually born. You just had a dream that you were born uh, into a body and that that body is you. And once again, it's very convincing, but uh, yeah, the truth is your body is no more uh, personal than that computer that you're using. Well, uh, it's just a tool. You could think of it as being a tool that you can use as a uh, communication tool if you want to. At one point, uh, the course describes the body as something that uh, can be used as a communication tool for the Holy Spirit uh, if you choose to use it that way. And if you ask uh, the Holy Spirit to speak through you and to communicate through you, then you can get used to working with the Holy Spirit and the body can be used in that manner. And uh, also, at one point, the Course says that, you know, forgiveness and being a teacher of God is uh, the natural profession of the members of the Sonship. Uh, so this is actually a very uh, natural thing, but it seems the opposite because of the way that we've been set up by the ego. So the spiritual ideas seem to be, uh, you know, kind of like far out there. And we don't question the ego's ideas, which are full of insanity. You know, if you really look at the world and uh, the things that go on in the world, which most people are in denial of, because even though they may uh, acknowledge what's going on, they don't acknowledge the thought system behind it and how the world uh, is actually, as the Course describes it, the dream of death. And uh, if you even look at the things we value, like nature, uh, and I've been really into nature the last few years. I've been to a few of the uh, na national parks. And if you look at it really carefully, you realize that everything there, uh, all of the animals are killing each other. 
And so, you know, we think of nature as being this beautiful thing, but it's still a dream of death. And, uh, you know, I'm just trying to lighten things up a little bit, you know, <laughs> but the truth is uh, that's everywhere. And unfortunately, there's nothing in the dream that can live without something else dying. And uh, that even goes to you vegetarians out there who put me down for eating meat. But the truth is, uh, plants have feelings too, you know, so, uh, and they're alive, you know, so don't lecture me about eating. <laughs> well said, well said. Um, I, I really like that you said about the communication tool. Yeah. How the body can be a communication tool by asking, you know, Holy Spirit, help me to help this body to be a communication tool for your purposes. And, uh, the, the ego's purpose versus the Holy Spirit's purpose and all about, it's all about purpose in the end. But um, great. Thank you for your comments. Any, did you want to add anything or? I was going to uh, add that if you're speaking to someone or even a group of people, uh, you may not know most of the people who are there, but the Holy Spirit does. Mm -hmm. The Holy Spirit knows what should be said uh, that will be best for all the people who are there, where you wouldn't have any way of knowing that. So there's a lot of good reasons to put the Holy Spirit in charge and uh, you know, to, to go from the Course and to uh, really invite the Holy Spirit in. Uh, the Course says that the Holy Spirit will uh, respond to your slightest invitation. So all you have to do is ask and uh, the Holy Spirit will be there for you. And the more you do it, the more you get used to working with the Holy Spirit. And, uh, the time will come down the road when you'll realize that the Holy Spirit is taking over your mind in a good way, in a voluntary way. And the reason it becomes so much fun is because you realize, hey, wait a minute, I am the Holy Spirit because I'm not a body. Just like the Course says, I am free for I am still as God created me. Well, if you're still as God created you, that means that you're still in heaven and you're still a spirit. And when you're at the level of spirit, it's all the same. So you're no different than God and you're no different than the Holy Spirit and you're no different than Jesus. And it really is all the same. But uh, I think that that experience comes uh, the more you do it and the more you dedicate yourself just to remembering. You know, at one point the Course says, what is a miracle? But uh, this remembering, and I might use that quote later, uh, to help define the bigness of what we are. But uh, I know that when I remember the truth, I feel peaceful. The only time I don't feel peaceful is when I forget the truth. But if I remember the truth, I always feel peaceful. So a lot of this is just remembering, you know, remembering the truth. And if you do, uh, everything that you know kind of like comes back to you at once. You know, you don't have to remember everything that you've learned, it's in your unconscious mind and it'll come back to you in the way that you feel because you'll feel more peaceful. And uh, you know, peaceful people are more loving than people who are not peaceful. Uh, so they kind of like go together. That's why the Course says, teach only love, you know, for that is what you are. And you start getting used to the idea that, wow, when the Course talks about love, it's talking about a big kind of love. You know, human love is fine. I haven't got anything against human love. I'm just saying that uh, God's love is the real deal. But you can uh, express love, certainly, in the dream, in the illusion. But I would remember to, to think with God that way, or at least the Holy Spirit, same thing. And think with the Holy Spirit, because then your love will be kind of like guided by the Holy Spirit instead of the ego. Thank you, Gary. All right, let's go to our next question. Eli Davy in Winnipeg, Manitoba, Canada. Yes. Take it away. All right. All right. Hi, Gary. I just wanted to say a real good hello to you. Hello, um, Eli. I've, I've been to Manitoba. Manitoba. Yes, yes. Last time we talked on one of these Zooms, you said that you had been here. Um, I wanted to say that I don't eat red meat. And I always tease that I don't eat meat because I love animals, but I hate vegetables. So I kill those and I eat those. 
<laughs> just for fun. I don't care if you eat meat or not. It makes no difference to me. <laughs> yeah. Regardless. Oh, anyway, no. my that meat isn't real either. I know it. Neither are those vegetables. <laughs> uh, whatever. If I don't want them, I eat chocolate. <laughs> I love chocolate. Okay, so some of us here on this call are going to San Antonio, and I'm one oh, of them, and I'm so pleased I'm going to get to meet you in person. That's great. But with that is my question. I have all four of your books, certainly waiting for the fifth, but I can wait as long as it takes. Anyway, if I bring a book, will you sign it for me? Uh, yep. Yeah. Actually, I do. I do a book signing at the end of every uh, workshop, but you have to wait till uh, the end. I'll because be there. I started doing it during the break or during lunch, then everybody would want me to sign their books and I wouldn't be able to eat. And I got to have that meat, <laughs> you know, so. Uh, yeah. But at five o'clock, yeah, usually I take about an hour and, and sign people's books. And if you want to have your picture taken with me, I love that crap. Okay, good. Yay! Oh, I'm going to love it, too. Thank you so much, Gary. Well, I'm glad you're coming. I, I've heard that there are people coming from different uh, places. So that's going to be uh, a nice gathering of people. Yeah. And I'm looking forward to it. Me, too. Thank you, Eli. By the way, when, when we did the workshop last year, I think people were still, you know, kind of worried about the uh, pandemic. And uh, they're not as worried this year, I can tell. I could tell from uh, the people that were there last week. So, you know, people are kind of like moving on from the pandemic and uh, they're learning to live with it and we'll see what happens. But uh, if it's a natural progression that the pandemic becomes endemic instead of pandemic and becomes something that we can deal with. Absolutely, very well said. And I just wanna ask everybody who's watching right now Type in San Antonio if you're traveling to San Antonio and type in virtual if you're going to get a virtual ticket because you can get a virtual ticket for the same price. You'll have the same access we have. We're hiring a, a staff professional people with two big cameras at the different angles and the whole nine for our virtual audience. So those of you who cannot travel to San Antonio will get a ton of value by being a virtual uh, virtual participant. So I see some virtuals. I see some San Antonio's in the chats. Shout out to all of you guys. And uh, let's go to our next question. This is Leasley in Los Angeles. All right. I'm in LA too. She's trying to unmute. Yeah. And uh, I think she's in her car. She's usually in her car. <clears throat> it happened. I am in my car. Can you hear me? We can hear yeah. you, but we cannot see you. I know. I, I've got like 5% left on my phone. Okay. Hold no on. Problem. No problem. I'm going to ask my question, even though you can't see me. Hi, no I'm in, um, I'm actually in a parking lot in South Pasadena right now. Well, good. I'm um, glad that you're not driving because uh, <laughs> we, we can no. see you. Not driving. Wow. Yeah. Okay. Um, so my question is, I, um, I've only gotten to chapter nine in the blue book. I've read all your books and I continue to reread them and listen to the audio and all of that. But in um, one thing I, I don't understand or I don't know what it is in the blue book is um, they talk about creating and our creations. And um, there was a, a quote I wrote down the other day that said, as long as you believe that fear is real, you will not create. And I wanted to know, what what are they talking about? Okay. Hello. Oh. <clears throat> yeah. Can you hear me? I can hear you. Okay. Good. Uh, the course doesn't get real specific about that, but it does make it very clear that your real creating is only done in heaven with God. So when it talks about your creations, uh, it's talking about the fact that when you're in heaven, you're exactly the same as God, and what you create is uh, kind of like an endless extension of what I would call perfect love because God is perfect love. And when you're in heaven, you're a perfect love and what you create is more love. It's kind of like a simultaneous extension of the whole. You know, so you're creating love in heaven. When the Course talks about this level, uh, the level of the world, 
it never uses the word create. You don't create anything in this world. According to the Course, you make things. So the Course will say, uh, in creations are perfect love compared to what you made, which is the world of duality, which, which for every good thing in uh, this world, there's something that is not so good and that you're not going to enjoy. So uh, God and the spirit that the Course talks about is actually perfect love, and that's what you really are. And your creations are in heaven and have nothing to do with this world. Now, having said that, let me say that you can certainly uh, extend love into this world. It's just that you're doing it as a communication tool of the Holy Spirit, you know, thinking of uh, the real love. And, and and it doesn't mean that you can't have human love too. Uh, as long as you appear to be here in this world, you're gonna do normal things, I hope. You know, everyone's gonna do something. You know, even doing nothing is doing something. So, uh, you know, like if you, you fall in love with somebody and you wanna get married, I'd say uh, get married. The only thing is you wanna kinda of like do it with the Holy Spirit and remember that your reality and that true love is in heaven. And then uh, the love that you have in this world can be a reflection or a symbol of the real love that you have with God in heaven. In fact, uh, let me add one thing, and that is that our relationships in this world were made up in order to substitute for the relationship that we thought that we lost with God in uh, the separation. When we believed that the separation was real, then in this world, we made up special relationships in order to try to substitute for the relationship that we thought that we lost with God. But that's all kind of erroneous because we didn't lose God. Uh, because as you know, the full awareness of the atonement is that the separation never occurred, which means that we never really left heaven, that we're still there and we're at home with God as the Course says, dreaming of exile, but perfectly capable of awakening uh, to reality, which we all will. Okay, so it sounds like the idea of creating and creation is not really that important. It's more that idea that you've been talking about on today's call where um, the focus is on realizing that you're dreaming and that it's all an illusion and that we are that perfect love. And, and that, I mean, that's, that it's not really like, I was kind of struggling with it, trying to figure out like, why, why is this important? It sounds like it's really just pointing us back in the same direction. It always points us. So, um, okay. Got it. Thank you. That's right. It's uh, pointing us toward reality. Right. You know, as a, as a musician, you know, I always thought that I was uh, creating, you know, so I'm creating music. And all artists think that they're creating, which is fine, you know, for them to say that. Uh, as long as you remember in the back of your mind, okay, that, that can be uh, a symbol or an expression of creating. But the real creation is in heaven, not in this world. Because there's nothing in this world that is real. The best that you can do is uh, symbolize love in this world. And that, that's a good thing, especially if you're doing it with the Holy Spirit. Thank you, Gary. By the way, I'm in LA too, and I'm uh, uh, looking forward to the uh, Academy Awards tomorrow. And people here, I live in Hollywood, and they get pretty excited this time of year. And you know, it's all it's all made up. You know, somebody, uh, my best description of the Oscars that I ever heard, uh, it's the uh, creme de la creme of bullshit. <laughs> Yes, well, we, we enjoy being in the thick of it. Yeah, we're in the thick of it, okay. Love it, love it. <clears throat> Thank you, Leslie. All right, let's go to our next person here with a question. Ga Gabby Alvarez, where are you calling in from? Hi, I am down in uh, Trabuco Canyon. Trabuco Canyon. To, yeah, it's close to Arvine, like forest. Oh. Okay, uh, California. Close as to well. LA. Yeah, close Wonderful. to LA. Hi, well, everybody. Uh, Hi, Gary. Yeah, well, I am is where I'm planning to go to when I win the, uh, you know, $20 million in the lottery. That's where the lottery headquarters is, is in Irvine. Oh. 
Um, first of all, thank you. Like everybody else, I am so grateful for your books and for Arten and Pursa. Without their help, I will not have understood the course either. Um, my question is that I started the course around four years ago and two years into the course, I fell in love with the course. I started practicing like I just jump into the pool. It's when you feel like this is my path, this answers all my questions of oh, thank And I jump into it. I start putting my life in the Holy Spirit's guides and asking for guidance, uh, doing all of it, everything that you explain in your books and all of that. Two years later, uh, my life just started to break, like everything that could possibly happen, it happened and really, really painful stuff, like really hard moments. And I don't want to get into it, but it seems like everything broke, everything went down. So sometimes keeping the trust, it has been hard. Like why everything went so bad in the, I know it's in the ego mind, but oh, let's not use the, it went bad. It went in a very painful way. Uh, why everything became so hard and so painful just after the course is, it's hard to keep the faith and the trust in the guidance. I find myself that now when I say, my day is in your hands, Holy Spirit, please help me to listen to your guidance. Now I have a little bit of fear in the back of my hands, like, but don't let it be that painful, please. That was really painful, you know? Like, how do I recover my trust? That will be the question. Well, uh, your trust, uh, I cannot depend on what happens in this world. Uh, I was uh, watching this TV show and there was a singer who used to be on uh, American Idol. And she just, uh, she was pretty young in her twenties and she just died of cancer. And she said something very interesting. She said, uh, you can't wait until life is easy before you make the decision to be happy. You know, and that's why of course Miracle says happiness is a decision that I must make. You know, and that happiness, real happiness, is not dependent on what happens in the world. Uh, it's something that you want to have be there for you, not because of what happens in the world. You want it to be there for you despite what happens in the world, regardless of what happens in the world. You know, so you want to be able to be happy no matter what because this is not your real home. As the Course says, this world you appear to live in is not home to you. And somewhere in your mind, you know that this is true. So this is not the happy world. And uh, it, it is possible though to have a happy dream while you appear to be here in this world. Remember the Course says, you know, how else uh, can you find joy in a joyless place, except by realizing you are not there. So uh, our happiness and our peace of mind and our love is not dependent on things going good in the world. Uh, and that's a good thing because if your happiness is dependent on what happens in this world, then you're screwed because it's always gonna turn to crap. You know, that's what the world does because this is a world of reality. I mean, duality. And the reality is oneness, and the duality is trueness. You know, kind of like there's a counterpart for everything. And even for every good thing, there's a counterpart that is not good. And uh, it's always going to drift back to that. It's kind of like, oh, the yin and the yang uh, going in and out of balance. You know, so it'll be good for a while, but then it's going to go bad. Uh, I was talking with somebody just a couple of hours ago and uh, the problems that she was describing to me, uh, believe it or not, are even worse than what most people could describe. But she's still prepared to forgive it and she's, she's still trying. And if you keep uh, practicing, then you can get to that point where you can be happy and peaceful 
really almost no matter what happens, you know, and, you know, maybe not all the time, maybe not 100% of the time. Obviously, the death of a loved one is the hardest thing to deal with and to forgive uh, in this world. And you may not do that right away. But even then, uh, with time, the pain goes away and uh, the heartache goes away. I know because I've lost uh, some of the closest people to me in this lifetime and the pain does go away, but there's something that doesn't go away. And what doesn't go away is the love that you have for that person, you know, because the love is going to stay with you forever. And uh, that's symbolic of God's love. And that's the kind of love I was talking about earlier. You know, so I wish that I could tell you that, uh, you know, things are always going to be good. They're not always going to be good. And by the way, these bad things that you're describing, they're happening to you. Uh, that's the ego script. And those things would have happened whether you started doing A Course of Miracles or not. You know, sometimes someone will say to me, Oh, I started doing the course and, and everything went to hell and everything started to go wrong. Uh, it did not start to go wrong because you started doing the Course of Miracles. Uh, those things would have happened anyway, because as the course says, the script is written. What the course does is it gives you tools to deal with the ego script. It gives you a different way of looking at it. It gives you a different perception. Uh, it gives you a different belief system. And uh, that belief system is not dependent on what the ego wants or needs. It's only dependent on your reality, which is perfect love. So I hear you as far as the way things are going. But uh, the only thing that I can promise you is if you, if you keep practicing forgiveness, no matter what, then you can get to the point where uh, it won't matter what happens and you can be happy and peaceful no matter what. Thank you, Gary. That helps. Thank Good. you. I'm glad. Thank you, Gary. Thank you, Gabby. Great question. Thank you for being Thanks. willing to share also vulnerability. Thank you. <laughs> Sorry. Oh, it helps everybody. I took a lot of notes on what, what, what he just said. And, and um, yeah, your question helps everybody. Every question here helps everybody. So thank well, you. I'm, your you know, I'm, uh, I'm invulnerable uh, as long as I get what I want. And uh, I'm also always happy uh, and I always like people as, uh, once they learn how to worship me. <laughs> that's, that's about the ego thought system, right? That's, that's, how, <laughs> that's how it works. Really? Thank you, Gary. All right, let's go to Christy Karsten. I know you are calling from a certain country, but I forgot which one. Hello, Christy. Hello, everyone. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Hello, Jared. Hello, Gary. Finally, Hi, I'm enjoying this Zoom call because previously I couldn't do that. So, uh, of course, I want to say thank you for your books because I guess only your books and the book Course in Miracles can help me go through all of this shit happening in the world sorry mm. for my <laughs> word so because i know that now i can have the different uh, prosperity of everything it seems to be happening around me because physically i am the closer to the ukraine and especially to russia now because i'm from kazakhstan yeah mm -hmm. kazakhstan has yeah. the border Russian Federation, it's awful for me. So I just want to share my thoughts, uh, my experience of a plan of true forgiveness with you, Gary, and to hear your opinion about that, okay? Sure. So thinking about how can I forgive all of this because it's so awful. Yeah, you know, you can hear that I can't forgive this because it's so awful, yeah? When the kids and uh, the old people are murdered, it's unforgivable, yeah? But I was thinking, how can I forgive this? And when I was meditating, I felt like Holy Spirit told me like, 
it's not actually uh, external hate. It's my hate to probably to my neighbors, to my parents, especially for God. And I have to forgive not them, not the Russian president or Ukrainian or something like that, or yeah, who is uh, out somewhere, yeah? But I have to forgive myself. I have to forgive my hate. And after that, I could feel like relief. Like mm -hmm. I know that I am even actually myself. And it means for me that there is nothing to forgive. It means that I let Holy Spirit to tell me that it's just a movie and I can, I can watch this like a movie, not taking uh, some, you know, like terrible thoughts or oh, it's awful and that's awful. No, I can watch this movie without any judgment. And that's it. Thank you for your books uh, again, because Without this information, I can't even imagine how could I live without this information. Thank you. Well, uh, it's, it's my pleasure. I think that there's a, a couple of different things uh, going on, you know, with the war. Uh, it always appears that you have victims and victimizers in the world. Now, in this case, most people would think that uh, Putin is the uh, you know, victimizer and that the people of Ukraine are the victims. If the world was real, that would be true. Uh, but the world is not real and that's uh, just a story. And our lives are just stories. And, uh, you know, as Shakespeare once said uh, in Macbeth, it, it's a tale told by an idiot, uh, you know, full of sound and fury signifying nothing. And Shakespeare knew it was nothing because he was enlightened and he knew that it's not real, that what we're seeing is not true. And that's the only reason that it's forgivable. If it was real, it would not be forgivable. And uh, the Course says that as long as we make it real, we cannot forgive it. It says you have made it real and so you cannot forgive it. The only way that you can really forgive something is in your mind to realize and to remember that what we're seeing is not true that we made it up on a different level that we're not aware of but because we can't see our own unconscious mind. But that's where this projection of a war in Ukraine is coming from and uh, it's very convincing. And so we think that uh, there are victims and victimizers and in, in this case, especially one victimizer. Now, the uh, stupidity of the whole thing and the hatred and uh, the unnecessary part of it uh, and, and everything that I could uh, think of to describe Putin is my hatred and uh, my guilt, you know, and uh, my uh, victimizing that I think I committed when I thought that I separated myself uh, from God. So what the ego does is it takes that incredible uh, guilt that occurred at the beginning of time and it denies it. And a psychologist will tell you that projection always follows de denial. So there's this guilt in my mind that I was not aware of and I, which I never would have been aware of if I didn't start studying A Course in Miracles. And if it wasn't uh, taught to me, you know, so well by others like uh, Arden and Versa and uh, Ken and uh, well, they're the main three. And uh, you know, if I, didn't learn the course, then I would have just thought that the war was real and that Putin was the guilty party. But now I can realize that there is no Putin, not really. Uh, just like the course says, there is no world. And it doesn't just say there is no world. It says this is the central uh, lesson that the course attempts to teach. So uh, you can either choose to believe the course or not. And some people, uh, they probably won't believe it because that means questioning everything that you thought was real and everything that you thought was true, including the war, uh, including all this suffering from people. Now, having said that, uh, and, and I sent out uh, an email a couple of weeks ago where I said, you know, 
the course uh, isn't about making the world real, but it is certainly about love. So because you want to teach only love, because that is what you are, you may find a way to help people in the Ukraine, not because you're doing the whole victim victimizer thing, but as an extension of love, you know, as an extension of the fact that you want to help. And even though you know that what you're saying is not true, uh, you may actually be inspired by the Holy Spirit uh, to find an even better way uh, to help people. Uh, if you're in, uh, you know, the kind of work that has to do with these things, you might even find a creative uh, solution, you know, to end uh, the war. You're not going to be able to please everybody, that's for sure. Because mm -hmm. uh, the conflict that we see out there on the screen is symbolic of the conflict that exists in our own mind. And the only way that you're ever going to have uh, peace on earth is to change that uh, inner picture that the Course talks about. What we're seeing is an outer picture of an inward uh, condition. And as long as you have conflict in the mind, you will have wars and terrorism and violence and murder and all the uh, mayhem that you see out there in the world. And someday, not in our lifetime, but someday the people of the world will have uh, inner peace. And when that time comes, which is why our work is so important, because we're kind of like on the uh, cutting edge. You know, we're only the second uh, generation that's doing A Course in Miracles. And uh, that's why it's so important to help people to achieve inner peace, because until the people of the world have inner peace, you will never have uh, peace on earth. The only way that you can do it is to have peace within, and then the outer picture would change. Yeah, you know, just like it says in the workbook, uh, if you take care of the cause, the effect will change automatically. So we're not yeah. going to achieve world peace uh, by by the conventional ways that the world has been trying to do it, you know, for thousands of years. And uh, in the meantime, we can do the inner work, which will lead to world peace, and we can do other stuff as an expression of our love uh, without believing in it. So I think that's the right place for a course student to be coming from. Yeah, thank you, Gar. I did really ask. I so glad and I'm so grateful that I have your books because they are really helped me to have my inner peace inside of me. It really helps me, thank you. Yeah, it's my pleasure. And by the way, uh, that's why Gandhi said that you have to be the change that you want to see in the world. And so he was peaceful. Now, uh, a cynical person might say, well, it didn't do Gandhi too much good because he got shot. Uh, but don't forget, I think he was like 81 or something. So yeah, it's not like he didn't have a, a long life. And he had a peaceful life. And uh, you can't put a price tag on the quality of your life uh, or on the peace that uh, can come about uh, that forgiveness can bring to you because it, it can bring about all kinds of good things that never would have been there for you if you just you know lived your whole life with the ego. Yeah, you can have completely different experience, yeah? You cannot have inner peace without, I mean, you cannot have external peace without having inner peace, yeah? Uh, that's right. That's why the Course says, seek not uh, to change the world. Uh, seek rather to change your mind about the world. Because then you're dealing with the cause instead of the effect. Now, that doesn't mean that you can't be normal and deal with the cause, too. As I said, you know, everybody's going to do something. But if you're going to do something, try to do it with the Holy Spirit and to do it with the Holy Spirit's love. Because that's what you really are. Really, thank you. Touch my heart. Thank you. My pleasure. Great to see you, Christy. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, give my regards to uh, Kazakhstan. Yeah, Kazakhstan, it's close to the Russian Federation. It's close to uh, the, if you know, the uh, Uzbekistan, Turkmenistan, it's Asia. Mm -hmm. Asia. Yeah. Yeah, so, that's one of the places I haven't been to, but uh, you never know. 
We'll see. I hope you could be there. <laughs> hey, you never know. I mean, I, I did a workshop in Tanzania. So, uh, you know, no, Tasmania. That's where the Tas Tasmanian devil lives. Yeah. And I did never workshop there. So, Jared, thank you for this opportunity. I, I'm really grateful. Thank you, Kerry. Thank you, Jared. Thank you, everyone. You're so welcome. All right, let's go to our next guest, Catalina Cornejo. Where are you calling in from? Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Mm -hmm. I'm calling from Colombia. But we can no, hear I'm having issues with my camera, so. Oh, okay, no problem. But if you can hear me, everything's good. Yes, okay. yes, from Colombia, welcome. Yes, so hi, Gary. Hi, Gary. Hello. It's so nice to finally be able to speak to you both and everyone. Um, I'm so grateful, Gary, for your work and what, I, what this has given me in terms of understanding the course and practicing it. I do have a question. Uh, I wrote it down, otherwise I, I would forget it. And it's the following. Uh, Gary, do you have any advice on how not to give up on this path? I've been a student of the course for about 12 years now, and I can say that I've experienced some visible results from this forgiveness practice. They've been minor things, but still convincing enough to encourage me to continue with the course. However, I've been dealing with a difficult situation for the past five years that doesn't seem to get better. In fact, it has become worse as time passes. And I'm at a point where I'm questioning if this forgiveness path is really what I should be doing. It's kind of hard in a sense to disregard it because after understanding what the course teaches, I can no longer believe or follow any other teaching that doesn't stick to the course. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, I've been experiencing so much frustration, anger, hate at this long lasting situation that it's also difficult to believe and have faith that forgiveness is actually working or will work. I know it doesn't always show visible results in the world and I can't accept that. It's rather this feeling of desperation in my mind and just experiencing how it lingers and expands as the situation goes on. What really has me doubting about the effectiveness of forgiveness. I've read in your books that you've dealt with the sort of slow burning situations and I'm just wondering how you managed to overcome that impulse to give up if you felt it or how you sustained your faith and believe that practicing forgiveness at the time was something that eventually would transform your mind and free you from conflict. If you have any advice on that, I would greatly appreciate it. Uh, could you repeat that? <laughs> I'm just <laughs> joking. You don't have to repeat that. Uh, okay, so there's like two levels, right? There's you know, what happens to you in the world, including all that uh, stuff you're talking about that's been going on for five years. Mm -hmm. uh, that's the ego script. And uh, that's what happens. Okay, the course isn't about that. The course is about how you're looking at what happens. So you can become great at looking at it with the Holy Spirit. And that will change how you feel about it. You can get to the point where it doesn't affect you. Just like the Course says about forgiveness. It says that it denies the ability of anything not of God to affect you. And then it says, uh, this is the proper use of denial. So th there's a proper use of denial, and that is to deny the ego and to uh, deny this world and to put your belief with your forgiveness in God and his kingdom. And the more you do that, uh, the more difficult it becomes for these things that happen in the world to affect you. And you can even get to the point where they can't hurt you, that uh, you can be happy and peaceful no matter what, really. Uh, and, you know, I'm not saying you're going to be jumping up and down uh, for joy when something bad happens. I'm just saying that you will know how to look at it with the Holy Spirit and you will know how to uh, think and be inspired by the Holy Spirit or, or Jesus, what, whichever you prefer. You know, it's the same thing. You know, they're not in competition with each other. Uh, I I talk to Jesus in my mind because uh, I I just always did, even when I was a kid. I, I thought he was my friend. I don't know why I I thought that, but I found out later why I thought he was my friend, and it was because he was my friend. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, so I've I've always had my big brother 
you know, the course describes, well, he describes himself in the course as uh, an elder brother. And I've always had my big brother to look to uh, for help in my mind. And, uh, you know, that's very helpful. But, you know, the, the kinds of uh, questions that we all have, you know, of course we want our lives to get better. And uh, at the same time, the happy dream is not dependent on circumstances. Uh, it's not dependent on our life getting better. The happy dream is there regardless of what happens, no matter what happens. And that's what we should be training our mind uh, to do. Because who knows what the hell is gonna happen? I mean, you know, there could be a nuclear war that could still happen. You know, and that's not gonna make anybody happy. It's just gonna kill most of us. And uh, at the same time, what if you're one of the ones that is left alive? You know, I mean, you probably wouldn't want to be alive uh, if you survived the nuclear war. But what if you did? Well, would you forgive? Uh, I mean, that would be like the ultimate probably forgiveness opportunity. But uh, at the same time, that's when you have to remember that the Course is saying, look, it's really true. There is no order of difficulty uh, in miracles because there's no difference between a nuclear war and uh, you know having cancer or something because neither one of them is true. You know, that's the whole point. That's why in order to learn this course, uh, it says it's necessary for you to question every value that you've ever had, because we're gonna think, well, of course one thing is, is better than another. And of course one thing is more important, but how can they be more important if neither one is true? You know, so I had to question every value I ever had. I figured, look, if I'm not a body, well, then I'm not an American. You know, I know it doesn't sound very patriotic, but how can I be an American if I'm not a body? You know, how can I be uh, of a certain political party if I'm not a body? You know, how can I be any of the, th the things that I thought I was if I'm not a body? So, you know, you gotta look and, and you gotta say, you know, the course is serious about this. Uh, there is no world, none of it's true, which means that none of it is valuable. And the only thing that is real is love. And uh, all the rest is BS. Awesome, Gary, thank you very much. Uh, thank you, I hope that helps some. It does. Great question, Catalina. Thank you for being so um, candid and, and honest and prepared. Great question. All right, let's go to Jennifer Ramsey Nolan. Where are you calling in from? <laughs> Hi, <clears throat> I'm calling in from Surrey, British Columbia in Canada. Uh, oh. It's outside of Vancouver. Um, so, hi everyone. Uh, thanks, Gary, uh, for being here and for all your books and amazing work, like everyone says. And thanks, Jared, and thanks, everyone. Um, so, I came with two questions, and one of them was Catalina. So, thank you, Catalina, uh, or very similar to that. And the other one is sort of similar to what Gabby asked earlier, but it's different enough that I'd like to ask it anyway. So, um, I've only been seriously and I got into the course because of your books. I'm one of those people who had it on my bookshelf for 15 years and couldn't quite give it away, but couldn't quite open it either. And uh, so your books, Gary, thank you, um, got me into the course. And I, you know, reading the text every morning, doing a workbook lesson every day, reading your books in the evening, you know, really into it, really into it. And my life got so much worse in the beginning, not because of anything that was happening, but because I had spent so many years building up this, internal thought system that I knew did not hang together, but it relied very heavily on relying on God for guidance in the world. And so I just felt like I fell into this massive hole where I was like, okay, if the world doesn't exist, then any guidance I get would just be meaningless. And I just couldn't get out of it. So I feel like I'm a little bit out of that. Like I went down real low. So I, I'm sort of out of that because I kept just listening to these, you know, YouTubes and reading books and reading the text and doing the exercises and stuff. But where I still really get a little bit stuck, I still get a little bit into the meaninglessness where I go, well, if I, if I don't seek to change the world, I only seek to change my mind about the world. And if the world is not real, and if, you know, all those things, 
then I just get stuck in like, why would I bother to do anything? Like it just, and I know that I need to still work for toward forgiveness to get the atonement and to work towards salvation and everything. But so that's one place where I get sort of stuck. And the other place is feeling like, where could I find the Holy Spirit in the world? And I sort of know the answer is nowhere. The Holy Spirit is in my mind. But when, like, when I'm thinking about that guidance, and I get really stuck there too. And I do remember hearing you say somewhere um, that a good way to think about those benefits in life or those good things that happen to us is like a fringe benefit where, you know, the more that we can feel peaceful and work on, and that really resonated with me. And I felt like that fixed my question, but it sort of didn't. So I'm still stuck a bit there. I hope that was articulate enough for you to work with. Thank you. <laughs> uh, well, uh, first of all, I'm glad that everybody here tonight is having such a good time in their life. Uh, it, it's really been interesting, but uh, it is true. Uh, you can be inspired by the Holy Spirit. The word, as you know, inspired means in spirit. And uh, the more you get used to working with the Holy Spirit, and there's the different steps of forgiveness, which we've explained at other times uh, here and in my books. And there's, uh, you know, the song of prayer, true prayer and joining with God. There are different ways uh, to get your mind more into a condition of spirit. And by doing that, and this is not what you know, it's about. I mean, forgiveness is not about getting stuff in the world. And tr true prayer is not about uh, getting stuff in the world. But having uh, said that, even uh, the course itself in the song of prayer uh, talks about the after effects, you know, the echoes, uh, the harmonics, because uh, the real song of prayer is a song of love uh, to God, to your creator. But the course says that, uh, yeah, that you can have these echoes of God's love later on. I, and I call those the fringe benefits because you can be guided to something better. It is possible uh, to have an inspired idea. Just one real inspired idea could change your life. And that does happen. Uh, and it's happened uh, to me. And there used to be a time that I used to be really into the self-help movement before I got into the course. And sometimes uh, I felt like my life got better and sometimes it didn't. Uh, the difference with the Holy Spirit is that the Holy Spirit will guide you to what is best for everybody. You know, not just you. Uh, the Holy Spirit can see everything. So the Holy Spirit will guide you to what is best for you and everybody else. And uh, it may not fit your pictures. You know, it may not be exactly what you want, but it will be peaceful and it will be helpful and it will be loving. And uh, those are part of the Holy Spirit's script, which is really just a different way of looking at the ego's spirit. So what I choose to do is focus on uh, getting my mind more in a condition of spirit. Uh, the more you undo the ego with forgiveness, the more that happens. And by doing that, I have found myself to be more inspired and to actually be guided sometimes to some really good things. And I don't always uh, get what I want, uh, but I, whatever I get, it seems to be good. It seems to be a good thing. Uh, but, you know, you could argue that, you know, I'm just a lucky guy. And maybe that's true. Maybe I just have uh, good karma. Uh, you know, when it comes to art in person, well, maybe I was just at the right place, you know, at the right time. Uh, I, when Helen Schuckman asked Jesus, why me? Why me? He just said, well, because you would do it. And uh, art in person said basically the same thing to me. Well, you know. You'll do it. And they knew that I had a lot of time on my hands and they knew that I would do it. And I did. So, uh, you know, I don't know everything, you know, but I do know that I trust the Holy Spirit because the Holy Spirit has earned my trust. You know, I'm not, I'm not some guy who believes in blind uh, faith. You know, I, I believe the Holy Spirit and I believe Jesus because they have earned my uh, trust by le leading me to good things and by making me feel that I'm not alone. You know, whatever happens in my life, I don't have to face it alone. I have somebody to face it with who will genuinely help me and sometimes guide me to something uh, that's better too.
Thanks, Gary. That's, uh, that's awesome. Thanks very much. Sure. Thanks, Jennifer. Great question. Glad you're here. All right. Let's go to our next guest, Joyce. Where are you calling in from? Hi. Um, you can hear me, right? I can. Yeah, great. Thank you. Yes, I'm calling from Taipei, Taiwan. Hi, Gary. Hello. It's so nice that you're here to help us, guide us to the right path. <laughs> No, I didn't have anything else to do tonight. So. Oh, <laughs> such humor. Thank you. Um, now I forgot my question. Oh, yeah. Um, yes, um, you are my first teacher guiding me to the Course of Miracle, and then I followed Ken afterwards. And uh, my question is, there's so many Course of Miracle teachers out there. And sometimes I... How do I know which one is true? I mean, in one of your books, you mentioned about an author and a book that you express an opinion that that's not that that he or she is not exactly the right teacher. But how would I know? Can you please answer that for me? Thank you. Yeah. Uh, well, you know, don't listen to anybody. Okay. Uh, except. Uh, you know, the teachings of uh, Ken Wabney, you know that he's right on, that he's yes. teaching the course and that he's not compromising on it. Uh, the same is true of uh, me and uh, Cindy. Uh, we do not compromise on the message of the course. Uh, there are very few other teachers in the world who really stick to the course, who do not compromise on uh, the teachings of the course. And uh, so I'd be very careful about listening to any of them. I mean, you know, uh, Ken, he has enough work uh, to last you the rest of your life, if, if you want. Uh, okay. I'm not as prolific as him. You know, I got other things to do. I like to travel, you know, and he used to get up at, you know, four o'clock in the morning and write. I'm just going to bed at four o'clock in the morning. So, you know, it's just you know, a totally different thing. And, uh, you know, I'm not going to be as prolific as him, but I do know, I think for a fact that my books stick to the course, but you don't see that. And you, you start to uh, learn the thought system so well, and you will, you will know the thought system so well that eventually you'll be able to tell the difference uh, if somebody is speaking the thought system of the course or not. You'll be able to tell to yourself. You won't need somebody else uh, to tell you. But I only recommend, aside from Sydney, me, uh, Ken's work. And uh, mm -hmm. I think that you know, the new uh, president of the uh, Foundation for Inner Peace, uh, her name is Tam, uh, Tam yes. Morgan. She's was, she was, she was Judy Scutch's daughter. Uh, yes. Judy passed away uh, a couple of months ago. Yes. And uh, her co president just passed away. Uh, you know, yes. There's a whole changing of the guard going on as far as the publishers of the course is concerned, but their job is mainly uh, taking care of the publication and distribution of the course. And so uh, Arden and Percy told me that the greatest teacher of the course is Ken. Yes. And they told me that I should learn everything that I can from him. I wish I could say that I've learned everything that I can from him. I, I haven't read all of his work or, or anything, but I, I did uh, go see him several times in person. I met him uh, quite a few times in person. I've read quite a bit of his stuff. And he's the only one I've ever seen there, aside from us, that really sticks to the course. Okay. And uh, once you get used to what the thought system is, then it's hard for me to recommend any of these other teachers because I don't see them uh, really sticking to the course. Okay. Thank you so much. That's very reassuring. Thank you. Sure. Yes, I second that as well. Thank you, Joyce. All right, let's go to my main man, Julio Navarro in San Diego. Good to see you, brother. Hey, how you doing, Jared? How you doing, Gary? Doing good, hey, Julio. Good, nice to see you guys again. So the main thing was to say hi because you guys are here. <laughs> um, That's right, right. But I wanted to ask you, Gary, and this might be a personal question, 
Uh, and, and it's funny how you ended up talking about the foundation uh, of the piece, because that was my question. Um, if you had a word with Bob, I was pretty surprised that he passed uh, uh, just recently, you know, the Judy passed and then and then Bob and 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 then I was like, wow, you know, what was what's happening? Where, where are, are all all of them just in line and going, going, you know, leaving us behind. <laughs> I, I, I didn't really feel that way, but, but I was questioning myself. And, and so my question today was about that, whether uh, you had some last words with them and if he gave you any good words to share. And the other question was, would you ever get involved with the foundation uh, uh, for the piece uh, to, you know, with them being part of them? Well, I wouldn't want to be a part of any uh, foundation that would have me as a member. But uh, the thing is, you know, you got to remember that this is a world of duality, right? So uh, some people are going to die fairly young and some people are going to live to be what we would call old. So you have like some of the people connected with the uh, foundation, like Judy, uh, she lived to be 90. Uh, her husband uh, lived to be 91. Uh, uh, her, uh, her first husband, Bob Scott, she was a member of the foundation in her piece. I call him kind of like the unsung hero of the Course of Miracles because he personally, over a period of 40 years or so, uh, sent out about a million copies of the Course of Miracles from his house, you know, to different places all over the world, and he's still alive, and he's uh, 97, and he just wrote a book, and I endorsed it, and it'll be out, uh, I believe, in two or three months. So, uh, you know, and friends of theirs like. Jerry Jampolsky, I didn't think that he totally stuck to the course, but you know, he lived to be something like 94. Uh, a lot of these people lived to be very old. And then yes, you have other people who died rel relatively young. Uh, Ken and Helen were both uh, 71. Uh, uh, Bill Thetford was 68, but you could say it's a miracle that he lived as long as he did because he had, uh, a, I forget what they call it, but uh, rheumatoid deep fever or something, rheumatic fever when he was a child and, and most of the people who had that had bad hearts later uh, in life. And, and that's just the way that it is. You know, some people are gonna die younger, some people. But if you look at the overall course community, uh, they still had a pretty high average age there. It's just that some of us appear to, to die uh, younger than others. I don't know how long I'm gonna live, but you know, as long as I feel good, that, that's, you know, that's great. I don't even know if I want to be in a body if it's uh, falling apart. <laughs> you know, so uh, but as long as I feel good, I'm happy uh, to be here and to share the thought system of the Holy Spirit. And uh, I do know, because I communicate with, with quite a few of these people, uh, they got to the point where they did not fear death. And uh, I know that Judy was like that, and uh, both of her husbands uh, were like that. And uh, if you keep practicing the Course, you realize that what it's saying is true, that there is no death and uh, that the body is just a, a temporary suit of clothes. That It's a throwaway. You know, your, your body's not uh, permanent. It's, it's just a temporary thing that you're gonna throw away. And the real you goes on forever and can never die and never will die. And besides, you're also gonna be surprised at how good you feel after you do die <laughs> because uh, just like the, the Song of Prayer section says, uh, they call it death, but it is liberty. So uh, you have a, especially if there's been real healing, uh, it says if there's been real healing, it talks about a higher realm uh, of death and a, a better experience. So that's why I tell people, look, uh, you know, do this and don't wait until uh, next year to do it. Because even your experience of death is going to be better and it's going to be different. It's going to be a lot more fun. And I know that those people who have passed away that were connected with the foundations, uh, I think that they ended up having a really good experience at the end. Uh, even Helen, who didn't really practice the course, even though she knew it was true, 
uh, just before she passed away, uh, because she had had cancer for a couple of years, she had a really pained look on her face and it was not a happy look. And then Ken went back to the hospital after she had passed away and the look on her face had completely changed. And she had this uh, really nice, beautiful kind of a smile on her face, a gentle smile, but nonetheless, it was beautiful. And that's when Ken remembered, you know, she told me that uh, Jesus promised her that he would be there for her uh, when the time came. And when Ken saw the look on her face, he realized that Jesus had kept his promise and that he was there for her. And uh, I'm sure that that's true of all the members of the foundation. And it can be true for any of us who work with the Holy Spirit and practice uh, you know, forgiveness. I think that Jesus would be there for any of us who ask. I think that all you have to do is ask. So uh, it's gonna be fun to see him again. Yeah, thank you, Gary. Um, I do want to share uh, uh, my mom. Uh, a couple years ago, my mom and I were in my bed in my uh, house, and we had one of these meetings, uh, Zoom meeting with Jared. And I was telling you, I was asking you regarding uh, how do I help my mom because she's she's now going to be turning eighty nine, and um, and obviously, you know, how do I was like trying to figure out how to help my mom, and you you told me just don't. You don't worry about it, just plant the seed. And um, because she was very attached to her old ways, uh, but I'm happy to tell you that she has, she has overcome so much just by planting that seed. Um, she's on the way here, I'm waiting for her right now. And by the way, we're in San Diego and she came from LA. <laughs> she was driving oh. from LA uh, in a, in a, in a Ben and um, so I'm waiting for her. She's coming because she really wants to attend this um, this uh, course in miracle uh, gathering we're gonna have, and she has committed herself to the Holy Spirit and and has let go much of her ways. That is very inspiring, very inspiring that to see her at 89, being so happy of letting go and and that she was very afraid of of be, of dying she was always afraid of dying and she's so much in, at peace now that she's like i just want to leave the moment and and he's so so grateful to see that and he helps me he helps me you know in the pack thank you gary oh thank you and uh thank you for sharing that with us it's very inspiring that's beautiful julio Good to see you, brother. Thank you. Good to see you guys. Yeah. All right. Our last question goes to Gabby Alvarez. Thank you. This Go is ahead. really quick, Gary. Uh, the question about the other teachers of the course uh, have me wonder, um, made me curious about what do you think about David Hofmeister as a teacher of the course? Just out of curiosity, like it piqued my curiosity, that question. Well, uh, believe it or not, I, you know, I'm not a big reader, and I've never read any of uh, David's books, so I'm not sure I have worked with him. I've heard him speak. He's very uh, charismatic, and I know that people like him very much, and uh, they think that he's enlightened, and maybe he is. I, you know, I don't know. Uh, when I've heard him speak, I found him to be very general, that uh, you know, he doesn't usually give you a lot of teachings about the course. Uh, he, he gives kind of like a general kind of a talk and, and usually he doesn't even do that for, for very long at all. Usually he goes right into uh, questions and answers. And uh, that's fine, but the reason I bring all of that up because, because he doesn't give uh, a detailed presentation of how he's teaching the course, it's hard for me to tell uh, exactly how he's teaching the course. So I certainly don't have anything against him. I'm just saying that I don't think I know him uh, well enough, you know, to comment on uh, on what he's doing. Okay. And uh, you know, I, I think that he and I would probably agree to disagree on a couple of things. I don't think uh, it's necessarily in harmony with the course to have people uh, come and live with you. And uh, you know, and that's just my opinion. But uh, 
you know, I, who knows best? I don't know uh, best. And I do know that he seems like a good guy and that we've always uh, gotten along in the, in the few times that I've seen him. We've always uh, been friends and, and we get along uh, just fine, but I can't really comment in detail about his teachings. Thank you, Gary. We have one more, Gary, can we have one more question from Darren Hedgewald? He didn't raise his hand, but he has a question. Sure, go ahead. Hey, hey. hi, Gary, nice to see you. You too. Yeah, I, was, I was curious about why we come to this world at all. Well, uh, we made a mistake. <laughs> we did? I mean, you were saying tricked by the ego, but are we just trying to learn the ego or learn separation? Is that why we're here? Are we trying to learn what love is? Well, it's kind of like a trick question at the same time, because we're not really here. You know, so uh, the course is saying, OK, right. you had a, a dream, but you only dozed off for like an instant. So there was what the course describes as this uh, tiny tick of time. And all of the things that seem to be going on are uh, kind of like a repeat of that tiny tick of time in which the Course says that terror took the place of love. You know, so uh, there was only one tiny tick of time. According to the Course, even that wasn't real and it was over instantly. And, but we're reliving it over and over again until we learn uh, to wake up. And that's really our purpose now, if you make it your purpose and that is to wake up. But we can't really say why we came here other than the fact that the Course describes this whole uh, thing as a mistake and that it doesn't really exist and that only God in his kingdom uh, truly exists. Now we could get into a back and forth where you could say, you know, how could this have happened? But what the Course says about that is that uh, there will be many questions asked that the Course does not answer. For example, how did the impossible occur? And according to the Course, the idea that the separation from God happened uh, is impossible and that it never happened and uh, that the separation never occurred. And then in, in the middle of the workbook, uh, Jesus says something very interesting about that question. You know, how did we get here or why did we get here? Uh, he says, there is no answer, only an experience. Uh, seek only this and do not let theology delay you. And what he's saying there is that the real answer to that question is going to come to you, uh, not in words, but in an experience. You know, an experience of what you really are and where you really are. And the Course calls that revelation. Uh, he calls it the complete but temporary suspension of doubt and fear. And what that means is that you get to experience what it's like to be with God, to, to actually connect with God and experience your perfect oneness with God. And Jesus is saying that that's the only answer that will ever really satisfy you. And that there are no words uh, in this world that will satisfy you, but at the same time, words can help you get to that place that is beyond all words. So in a way you could say that the half a million words in A Course in Miracles are designed to get us to a place that is beyond all words. And when you experience that experience of your perfect oneness with God, that's when you realize that you were there the whole time and that you never really left. And uh, you know, that's the best answer I can give you is that once you have that experience, that's the real answer. Yeah, I kind of, I kind of put the cart before the horse. Of course, I had an awakening very similar to that before I knew about the book or anything. Yeah. And uh, I got a few messages and stuff, and I basically was doing what the course was doing. You know, I just stopped hating everybody. I forgave everybody in my life one mm. by one, and the more I did it, the more love I felt. And I just kept doing it. It's like a snowball. And then I had like a six week experience. It's just crazy. About a year and a half ago. And then I was directed to the books and, and they, of course, they made a lot of sense to me right off the bat. So it's been a wonderful experience and reading your books is wonderful too. Well, thank you. And thanks for sharing that uh, with us. Yeah, it's great to yeah. see you. Nice to meet you. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Darren. Darren.
Come Thanks, on down, Jared. Antonio, <laughs> sir. Yes, I, I'll get over there sometime. Awesome, I gotta meet Gary. That's right. That's right. So, um. Gary, um, didn't you have like uh, a experience where you saw all of your bodies that you were you you had or lived through? Didn't you see all your bodies in a a part of your one of your books? Yeah, well, I've had a couple of experiences uh, like that, but I, but I think one you're referring to is when uh, this time when Arden first appeared to me, and what uh, they did was they showed me what I looked like in all of my different uh, incarnations. And there were so many of them. It was really uh, amazing. And it was one right after another. They would just go, there's one, there's one, there's one, there's one. And they would just keep appearing as all these different people with all different shapes and sizes and clothing and, and everything. And I think the reason that they did that was to show me, look, if you've had so many lifetimes, then how can that one that you think that you're living right now be that important when you've had thousands of them? And I think that's part of the message of the course that the, the body is not as important as you thought it was, but there is a continuum uh, to life, just like it says in the, uh, you know, uh, Manual for Teachers, it says, you know, birth was not the beginning and death is not the end. And there is a, an eternal continuum to it even in illusions, you can't kill it. It keeps going on forever. That's so beautifully said. And I think that's the best way to end our call tonight. <laughs> great, great. Um, well, it's great being here and I'm looking forward to uh, San Antonio. It's gonna be a, a, a great day and a great workshop. And San Antonio itself is fun too. Oh yeah, absolutely. The Alamo, the river walk, we're gonna do the whole nine. Beautiful. Yes, and I just want to show everybody the website really quickly. It's on Eventbrite. So if you go on eventbrite.com and you type in the search Renard, if you type Gary's last name, then it will pop up. You may have to put San Antonio, but maybe not. It doesn't matter. I think you'll just you'll get Gary's event right here. And then once you click on it, you will be taken to the, uh, the page here. You can get all of the information. So this event is going to be in person and also live stream. So again, wherever you're at, Christy in Kazakhstan or any of you in any country, our friend in Taiwan, wherever you're at, you could be on this. Um, it's gonna be from 10.30 a.m. to 5.30 p.m. And uh, there's an early bird price through April 1st. So the, that price is $85 for the early bird price. After that, it goes up to 109. So definitely get your tickets before the early bird price expires. Um, and for those of you who come to San Antonio, this location brick at Blue Star is uh, pretty much downtown. It's a wonderful modern uh, location. And we've done, we did last year's event there, it was amazing. And so um, you'll be in a great environment with all these people if you're able to come to San Antonio and uh, really excited for everybody who is traveling and, and the live stream as well. It's gonna be very, very, high quality and so i'm excited for the event and again thank you to gary um, for taking time out of your busy schedule and i'm going to stop the screen share again um, everybody uh, that wants to join our group find us on facebook living a course in miracles audiobook club and that's all i have gary what would be your final message for everyone watching uh two things uh first of all in the next a uh, few days if you're on my email list uh, I'm also going to send out a dedicated email about the event and it will have a link to the same page so either way you, you can find out the details about it uh, what I'd like to close with is a quotation uh, from the course because I started out by saying you know how big we are compared to uh, how small we think we have become and this quote I think really kind of like gives you uh, the magnitude that the course is talking about. And when it talks about uh, the fact that you're bigger than the universe of time and space, the fact that uh, what you really are cannot even be contained by the universe. Uh, this quote is from uh, the Forgotten Song section, which was uh, not only Helen Shuckman's, but also Judy Scutch's favorite section of the course. And it goes like this, uh, it says beyond the body, beyond the sun and stars, 
uh, past everything you see and yet somehow familiar is an arc of golden light that stretches as you look into a great and shining circle. And all the circle fills with light before your eyes. The edges of the circle disappear and what is in it is no longer contained at all. Light expands and extends into infinity, forever shining and with no break or limit anywhere. Within it, everything is joined in perfect continuity. Nor is it possible to imagine that anything could be outside, for there is nowhere that this light is not. And this is the vision of the Son of God, whom you know well. Here is the sight of him who knows his Father. Here is the memory of what you are. And uh, the end of that section says, what is a miracle but this uh, remembering, which I was talking about earlier, the trick is to remember. You know, what is a miracle but this remembering? And who is there in whom this memory lies not? And then it says, the light in one awakens it in all. And when you see it in your brother, you are remembering for everyone. So every mind is connected. So when you remember the truth, uh, you can't help but be an influence on everybody else's mind. And that's why the Course talks about an interlocking chain of forgiveness. You know, it's all connected. And it's all going to end up with us as one instead of this you know, seemingly separate uh, sonship that the Course talks about sometimes, which is merely metaphor because the truth is you can't even separate illusions that we've always been one and we always will be. So beautifully said. Well, thank you so much, Gary. We really appreciate you taking time out of your busy schedule. And well, it's my pleasure. Man, I was just impressed how you looked in the camera and said that, like, so well memorized that part. <laughs> That's awesome. Well, I might have gotten a couple of syllables wrong, but I just keep going. It was, I, thought, I thought you were look down here reading because my eyes were closed. And then I looked up and you're like, full eye contact to the camera. I'm like, wow, you got this memorized. That's beautiful. I know a lot of the course by heart. So, so awesome. Well, thank you for, for being that example for us. And um, really just leading the way. We appreciate you, love you, and uh, look forward to seeing you in a couple of weeks. Me too. Exactly, uh, yeah, four weeks, I think, from tomorrow. Yep, four weeks from tomorrow, we'll be here. All right, guys and gals, uh, make sure you tune in to Sue Ann Knobloch um, for tomorrow's Zoom as well. She's gonna be hosting a great Course in Miracles call, and uh, we will see you all next Friday, uh, back to our normal time with, uh, with Ken Wapnick content. And so let's go ahead and unmute the lines and everyone say good night and God bless. Good night. Hey. Good night and God bless. Thank you, Gary. Thank you, Gary. Bye. 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 Thank you, Gary. Bye. Bye. Thanks, Gary. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Love you. Love you guys. Bye. Bye.